Oh, hi. Like JR said, I am Claudia Marsh. I am on the CTAM Education Committee, which, uh, so I got to work on bringing these awesome conferences to uh, Michigan for this week. So real quick, there are more conferences to come up this week if you are interested in seeing some other um, uh things about theater. We got technical theater class tomorrow with using multimedia techniques. And then on Friday, it's our youth theater class. So if you know some young people interested in learning about the technical side of theater, that is our Friday um, seminar. So, but for today, we are doing a directing class about preparing for auditions. I know as a director, that is a huge monumental task of getting ready for even before the show begins. So we have three presenters today to talk to us in, I believe, a round table format. Um, we have Keely Stanley Bone. So Keely has worked as a professional actor and director at theaters all across the nation with increasing forays into Eastern Europe. So she's been in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, um, and most recently directed uh, the show Fireflies in um, outside a concentration camp at Prague. Um, she is a professor at uh, Central Michigan University, a professor of theater, where she directs, teaches acting, directing, stage combat, dialects, and theater and the Holocaust. Um, also on our panel is Penny Notter. Penny is recently retired as associate director of Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Civic Theater. Uh, she is also the director of GRT's School of Theater. She has extensive experience as an actor and has directed dozens of shows, most at theaters in the Grand Rapids area. Uh, she has also conducted numerous workshops for CTAM and ACT. So we're excited to have her here for this one. And then our third panelist is Stephen Berglund. Uh, Steve Berglund is currently the chair of the Department of Theater and Dance at Central Michigan University. Steve has been acting professionally and directing for over 40 years. He recently wrote and performed Man, a solo performance piece, which was performed at uh, the Indianapolis Fringe Festival, the Chicago Fringe Festival, and United Solo in New York. Um, he has acted in several films, including Making Time and Niner. So those are our three panelists. Um, Keely will be moderating this, uh, this round table. So I will pass it over to her. And I just wanna remind everybody to please make sure that you're um, muted and that your cameras are off for the, uh, for the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, I'm Keely, as you can see with my name on the screen there. Uh, thank you for joining all of us. I'm excited about this conversation we're about to have. Um, and I'm so happy Steve and Penny have joined me in this conversation so that we can um, have different perspectives. The goal, we have an hour. And then at the end of the hour, we, or you know, around that time, maybe a little sooner, maybe a little later, I don't know. Um, if you have questions, I, I hope you will put them in the chat and then we will talk about them, join in the conversation with us. We have, um, I did, <laughs> because I'm used to doing this in class, I did develop just a little bit of a Prezi so that we can see the goals where we wanna talk about today, because what we're doing, I'm gonna share my screen for a second and then I'll come back. Um, we are going to, my screen is cleaned up from before, but here we go. <laughs> it's still a little full. There we go. Um, a director prepares, and, and many of you in the audience may already be a director or um, uh, are, are wanting to be a director. So this, some of this you may know, some of it you may go, oh, that's a way to do it. I love having these kinds of conversations because I always learn um, more about what I can do better too. So, but as a director prepares, there are just to keep me on track for on the conversation. I have five um, elements that I would like to talk about. So, research, script analysis, looking at concept statement, designer meetings, rehearsal schedule, and then the fifth one, audition form slash audition scenes. How do you choose the scene? What scene do you choose for a particular play? What are you looking for? Um, my goal here is that we'll start with a topic, and this is really just to keep me on track, 
Um, and then I'll take a question to Steve or Penny, who will start the conversation about research, for example, and then we'll have a conversation together, um, the three of us, about things we've done, haven't done, would like to know um, our, our mistakes sometimes, and then also what we've learned from what we've um, done over the years. So the very first question with research, I would like to direct to Steve. Um, what research do you do in preparation to direct? And remember, we're kind of gonna look at the genres, contemporary classical musical theater, huge variety of plays within all of those, obviously, but we'll look at um, these in, in relationship to research. So Steve, I'm gonna turn it to you. Thanks, Keely. Um, a couple of things, I don't know if these are true or not, but I've heard these through my career and, and I think there's some truth in them. And I believe that 70% of a director's work is done before they even get to auditions. And 90% of good directing is casting. <laughs> so, um, if you take those into consideration, it means that, that we need to be doing most of our work before we even get into auditions. And if we've done our, our research and script analysis well, and, and then cast well, our, our work is, is well on its way. The first thing I do with a script is to simply sit down and look up every word. Even, even words that I think that I know, any word that I think that I know, I look that up. And I wanna look it up just for its literal meaning, but also to find its connotative meaning, but also to make sure I know how to pronounce that. It's tough um, to then move into research if you don't know what you're researching. I look up everything from uh, historical names, dates, uh, locations, cities, uh, neighborhoods, uh, anything. I, I look those up just to have a place to start. And that often becomes the basis of my research because then the research is uh, very specific as it relates to that play rather than general research. And I'm a, I'm a huge research fan. Um, one other thing I would, I would point out is that one of the things that I do, I'm talking about Shakespeare now, one of the things that I do when I work on Shakespeare is I usually work with five or six different editions of the play because every edition will be different. And so I'll read a scene, uh, I'll make a few notes about punctuation, about word choice, uh, about even sometimes what characters are given certain lines. And then I'll go to the next uh, edition of the play and I'll read the scene again and I'll compare the two and I'll do all five of those and then come to an understanding of, of what the scene is about, but also what language I wanna use, what punctuation I wanna use, because it's all different in Shakespeare. In terms of general research, uh, it, it, it's endless in terms of what you need to know about a play, in terms of economics, in terms of art, and, and the play will inform some of that. But again, I go back to a starting place of the script and every word in the script as a place to, to jump off from. Thanks, Steve. Penny, do you wanna join in? Yes, I, I totally agree with the 70 and 90% percentages, totally agree. Um, he talked a little bit about Shakespeare, which is, uh, is a daunting task the minute you decide to, to do it. Um, I was, thought that I would recall with you. Um, recently, I did the Women of Lockerbie, which is a real event that happened, the plane that was blown up and landed in Lockerbie, Scotland. Um, and it's a play that's set 10 years after the accident. Uh, it was, well, first of all, I'm really old. And so, when I first started doing research for plays, I would live at the library. It would, that was, I would be there for days getting, getting stuff and making people dig for me. Now, of course, my very best friend in the world is the internet. Yay. And so everything is there. 
you just got to find it. Um, so when we were doing the Women of Lockerbie, uh, we set up a, a Facebook page and then people, uh, the actors would look up stuff, send stuff, articles, videos, whatever. So we had this big file of information uh, about the event and about the 10 years later and all those things because it really happened. Some of the people, some of the uh, women of Lockerbie are on video 10 years later, uh, with the real people. And so they were able to see um, where they were at at that point in their lives instead of when it just happened. Uh, so it was a very exciting, fun. I learned about Scotland. <laughs> yeah, so I did it. I came in with a, a bunch of stuff and then we put it all on, online for each other. But they, they found great things. So everybody played the game of being a detective. And that's what you start out to be. You are a detective. And so all of the characters you have to research, whether real or not real, it doesn't matter. They're real in the play. And then where you are, is so important uh, and as Shakespeare you can go all over the world people change locations and put themselves wherever they feel like it might be work best for the play and then um, and when and, and so it's who where and when that's the director's big chunk to follow and research and when uh, time uh, is essential uh, to know what was happening there, where you are and what was going on. And as Steve said, it's it's everything in the, it's economics, it's culture, it's environment, you know. So you really are creating a whole world. Um, I too love it. It's one of my favorite things to get ready. <laughs> well, and I think I would imagine the, the Lockerbie project that you had all of the actors contributing to the ones so that helped develop an ensemble on top of that. Because yeah, and, and plus it was a very ensemble show, but yeah. yes, uh, actors, you know, really can think and, and they do like to, to play with you. And um, that's why we call it a play. <laughs> no, no, but yes, it is very helpful in the research to have everybody join in. Yeah. So and that I was, was the first time I, that was the first time that I had ever done that. And that was just a few years ago. And it was so beneficial to all of us. Yeah, I'm doing a play right now. It was set in 1952. And my my actors are we've done a similar thing with Google Doc so that they are looking up. There's lots of things that they don't know that happened in 1952. Like who's Senator McCarthy? Hmm, OK, well, we're going to work <laughs> and figure all that out. Um, I wanted to just um, add on a little bit with what Steve was talking about with looking at the different editions of Shakespeare. Similarly, with a play, any play by Chekhov or Strindberg, or you know, looking at translations, I like to look at as many translations as I can before I commit to one because you know some are too lyrical, some are too strident, some are you know, if, especially with Chekhov, you know, David Mamet is very different from Jean Claude Bonadali, so it's like. Um, how do you, you know, it's something, and then you're like, oh, I wish I could take some of this one and some of this one. And, you know, but when you pay for the rights, you're only getting the one translator, not everybody else. Um, although if you look at the original Russian, which I do have a, a compilation of Russian. And so, cause I, I took Russian a long time ago and I'd be like, oh, that word, what does it mean? Da, da, da. Um, but I do think that it's really important with, with Shakespeare, with other uh, language plays, to look at the, the edition for Shakespeare, look at what the editors did. Is it the second quarto? Is it the first folio? How did they change? And what's gonna suit your, your play, the production you're doing the best? Um, looking at the different translations, looking at what you were saying, Penny, about when is it, where is it? Because when is so important, not just in the big picture, is it 1952? And then is it morning? And then is it nine in the morning or is it, 11 in the morning, did your character oversleep? Those kinds of details that are so exciting for actors to play 
um, but can be real, glo really they glossed over if, if the director, at least in my experience, if a director isn't gently guiding them to make those choices. Now I know that's after you cast the show, but before um, knowing as, as yourself, as the director knowing when it's taking place. And then obviously, which leads me magically to script analysis, how'd that happen? Um, let me just share my screen one second again to show, uh, where did it go? I bet you don't want to see all of that. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> I think that might be your son. Wrong <laughs> uh, computer, right? Sorry. Uh, whoops. Okay. So, so again, potentially looking at contemporary classical and musical theater, what are the analysis requirements for you within the various genres and styles of plays. And I know Penny, you had wanted to talk about like Givens and the detective work, you kind of touched on it already, but would you um, lead us in this one? Yes, I, I think what everyone has to know is you really are a detective. I mean, and I am a law and order person. So I, I really am, love that part. Um, <clears throat> but what, we, what I mentioned before was the who, in your play, who are the hoots? Well, that's not just a few characters. You got to figure out each one of those characters. Now, the actor is going to come in and do their own work later, okay? But you have to know who they are, where they are, what's their relationships, uh, um, what's an obstacle for them, what do they want? And so each character, you as a director have to Analyze. Now, if you have a course of 50 people, you do not have to analyze each of them. Okay, but all of the speaking parts, I would say. Um, so the who's take a long time. Okay, and then it's the when's. And when it is, it's, it could be right now, today, it could say present day. Well, that's a whole lot different than, as you said, Keely. 1952, I feel like in my long career that I have probably done more history, learned more about the history of uh, the errors, eras in our uh, society by doing all this research. And it, it really does pay off sometimes. It's kind of fun. Uh, but you really have to be specific because 1952 in New York is different than 1952 in California. Okay. So that's another thing, and you must be very detailed in this. You know, it can't just be, um, well, we're in Wyoming. No, 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 no. You have to be very specific. If there is not an actual place given in the script, if it's not written there, then you can make it up. But when I talk about givens, I'm talking about things that are in the script. You. It's, you can't deny it. You can't change it. That's a part of the script. That's a part of the story that you're going to tell. So givens are clues. And um, so look exactly like um, a detective. Okay. And the other thing is, well, oh, I think I just said that. <laughs> when and where. Who went and where. And, and, and it's detail. It's not just we're here, I'm in New York City. No, you're not just in New York City. You're in a block, you live somewhere. If you, if it's not a given, then sometimes you can make it up. But often they will say a street. Now on the internet, you can actually go and look at that street. And so talk about getting a sense of atmosphere. Um, so, and then you will later on share that with your actors. So I think I said enough. <laughs> um, it would, I would just jump off of that, and um, I often talk about, when I'm talking about script analysis, I talk about what is certain, what is, and Penny, I think you were talking about that, what is certain, what is absolute, what is given in the script, right. and then the next layer for me is what is probably true as a logical extension of what is given, and then the creative part of it, I think, is what is possibly true. Uh, what what is reasonably true, uh, or that I can creatively come up with that makes sense and helps tell tells the story, um, based on the analysis of the, of the script. 
I, I want to add one other thing, and this really came from a from an acting standpoint rather than a directing standpoint. But I I love the research. I'm Penny. You and I, I I'm the same. I love the process. I I love the work. I know Keely does too. Keely's a, a was a history major. She knows a lot of stuff about history. <laughs> but one of the things that I was I don't want to say chastised for, but I was warned is that there comes a point where you can't act the research. You can only act the play. And so script analysis and research is that I always think of actors as sort of empty vessels. And for each show, I go in empty and I start filling myself up with all of this analysis and research stuff. I don't know what I'm going to use or what I'm not going to use. Some of it comes out in ways that that I that might be more subconscious than conscious. Um, but I, I, I have to be careful as an actor sometimes that I'm trying to act the research rather than the play. I, I played Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran pastor in on the plots to kill Hitler at one time. And, and I was told by the director, OK, you've done enough research. You have enough information. Now you need to act the moment to moment honestly. So research doesn't take the place of acting. It's there to support the acting. And, and it supports everything else. We're going to talk about design meetings. Without doing all this work, you can't go to design meetings. You, you don't know how to set up your auditions. Um, you, I, you, you, you can't begin to block. I mean, almost everything comes back to this research and analysis. Yes, and, and that's why, I mean, like I said, it's not a particular order, but beginning with research, reading the script, obviously beginning with research, looking at the script analysis, going hand to hand, hand in hand with that. The idea of, um, and I do love history, and I do want to like, um, but I think you're right, Steve, it's, you can't act that. You, it, it informs what we do, but you can't, you know, it has to be lifted off the page. It has to be brought to life. But I do think it's important, at least for me as a director, I have to have a good grasp of it before I go into my design meetings, before I go into auditions for sure, because if I'm not sure of where we are and when we are and who they should be, I can't select the right cast. And Steve, you said it, what is casting 90% of the, whatever percentage you said, I know I hear between my <laughs> tiny. Um, but I, and I do agree with that. Sometimes you cast someone so perfect for the role, like, wow, my, my work is done there, you go. I'm just gonna guide you, right? But part of the script analysis, I wanted to just uh, uh, add on to it is the, when I, I do like to take a play and they don't all lend themselves to this, but to break it down into the units or beats so that I know, wow, something shifted here. And now I'm now the, act, the characters are pursuing this and now they're gonna pursue this. I don't have all of that completely done before auditions. I have a general sense because if that character has to take a journey that is particularly maybe hard to act or I think it might be hard to act, I, you know, I, that's gonna lead me toward a different person potentially in the, in the audition uh, process than if I didn't know that. Because if I didn't know that and I cast someone who I think, oh, they can do the beginning of the play, but I don't really know the journey of the character in the middle of the play. And then I've done that after a disservice, you know, maybe putting them in, um, my husband's a, a, um, a coach. And so he often says, you know, I wouldn't put someone who's not ready to play at the varsity level, you know, maybe a freshman in the varsity game if they're not ready to play at the varsity level. Same kind of thing with regard to if that person isn't, if I cast someone who's not ready to do what that character has to do, that's kind of my fault because I didn't know, right? I mean, that's my responsibility as a director to, to set them up for success in that way. Um, yeah, so that's why I just want to add that in with them because I get right detailed into like intentions on lines and things like that, which those you're right, you can't think about intentions when you're in the moment with a scene. You got to play the words and play with the other actor and what they're giving you in that moment. Um, so should we go? To the next one. All right, I'm gonna try to do this better. Oh, I didn't share my screen. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to um, save you all from my, uh, there. Well, that was better. There we go, right? I hope you can all see this. Um, so script analysis into our third one, we're moving right along. 
concept statements slash design meeting. So this is a big chunk. We're not going to get a lot. I mean, I, I, I wanted to touch on this because these are things that have to be done, in my opinion, as a director, before you, before you cast. But looking at how important are concept statements, and we can all talk about that if we, if we think they're really, really important, maybe half important, depending on the show. Another important question, how do you approach meetings with designers and other key production people? And these are all the key production people. We have designers, scenic, costume, light, sound to begin. We have music director, if you're doing a musical, you have choreographer. You might have an intimacy director, depending on the play that you're doing. You may have a fight choreographer. All of these people, if you're the director, you need to have a handle on, on their schedules, on their take on the play, your, your, you clearly articulating your vision for the play. That's where concept statements come in. Um, and I didn't know, Steve or Penny, if either one of you wanted to take that first. Well, I'm, I would like to just talk for a minute about an experience that I had when I was in grad school 142 years ago. I um, studied with uh, Hobgood, who had written one of the textbooks on directing, and um, he suggested that um, a concept statement, and, and, and that comes in a lot of different forms. People use a lot of different phrases for that. But he was interested in how do we communicate? After we've done the analysis and the research, how do we communicate? Keely, I like what you said, our vision of the play to, to designers and all of these other people that the collaborators in the play. And he used to ask directors or train directors to do a thing, he called it a, a viz. And it was without words. It wasn't a, it wasn't a verbal explanation. He suggested that you create a, 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 a completely immersive experience for whoever you're trying to communicate with. That would include sound, music, heat, cold, um, lighting, and, and not lighting for the show, but lighting to create this sense of mood, this sense of tone, uh, all of these things. It, it might send you into a dark room that's, that's with uh, lace or silk hanging or burlap hanging. And so that becomes a visceral, maybe that's where biz comes from. It becomes a visceral experience about experiencing not the intellectual part of the play, but but the sort of sensory part of the play. And I, I've always loved that idea. It's, it takes a lot of time, but it might lend itself to how can I best explain this? We had a, a scenic and lighting designer and the first question he always asked me was, what is the, what is the physical texture of this play? He always asked, he said, is it, is it polished metal? Is it uh, burlap? Is it sand? Um, and I always thought that was a great question because it made me think about the play in a, in a slightly different way. Penny, have you done concept statements? Or whatever, however you wanna call them. I mean, you're right, Steve, they're called different things sometimes. I, I don't care what you call me, just call me. Anyway, um, the sensory thing that Steve is talking about is one of my favorite things. Um, but I, I think maybe I do it too simply. simply. But for instance, um, sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's this show is like cotton candy. Not just the way it looks, but the way it tastes. It's, it's sugary, it's sweet, it's pastel you know it's it's cotton candy um it, you made me think of something interesting that i years ago i did company and the minute i knew i was going to do it all because i lived in new york for several years all i could see is gray i said this has to be gray because new york is gray so there's color in the and sound is my all-time favorite thing. And uh, sometimes I've had the luxury of working with a composer 
um, to do the sound, and that's really exciting. Um, and a lot of you in your communities have people that do that. Um, and you can search them out and they're, they're fun to work with. Um, but there is a sound, there is a, you hear it, you can hear it, it's in your ear when you start to think about it. Not the music of the show, it's the music of the whole thing, you know. Is it upbeat, is it dreary, is it not dreary, that's a stupid word. But anyway, I totally agree with Steve that there is, the, that's my concept stuff. And that is the stuff that I take to the designer. And sometimes they tease me and say, you know, what's the food today, shrimp? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, it's very valuable to do that. I agree. And I know um, with sometimes because of the research and script analysis I love to do, I get too heady or cerebral and the bringing into what I teach in directing class, the mood metaphors or those kinds of the, the very sensory kinds of um, descriptors that help not just, if, if, you, if you're disciplined enough to, to form those, those images for yourself, it helps, right? As opposed to, yeah, it's kind of this, as opposed to, no, it's as you were saying earlier, Penny, about specificity, be specific in these images as well, or these sensory um, ways of, of the, the sensory language that you would use to describe the play that you're doing or how you see the play or where it can go. Um, which then would lead me into the second part of this part three, the third topic, um, meeting with designers, collaborating with designers. I know that's a longer process than just before you get to auditions. But when you meet with the designers and you have a clear vision for the play, what, what happens when you sit down with a designer who um, has a completely different vision of the play? How have you handled that in the past? Or even if it's happened? Well, Keely, I would, um, it, it depends on what we talk about it, when we talk about the vision of the play. Um, because I, I don't, um, I'm not a scenic designer. I'm not a lighting designer. I'm not a sound designer. I'm not a costume designer. And a lot of the questions, I, I try to go in with that sort of vision statement um, and hope that what I want to do is I want to create a feeling. And then, because designers know what they're doing, I want them to design the play. And, and I think um, some directors struggle with that. Um, I, I often, I'm, and I'm very pragmatic, I, I talk about how many entrances and exits I need and how many square feet I need for certain scenes, and then say, now you make us look good as designers. Um, I, I'm not going to tell them what it should look like or, or, you know, that's not my job. And, and we collaborate better if, if I can create the, the motivation, the clear vision, so that they can take it and run with it. The question you asked is a completely different vision. I, I, I don't know what you do with that. You, you communicate as well as you can about the nature of that vision. Um, uh, but I think there's a difference between vision and actual designs. And I, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, I have to be able to communicate a vision, but that doesn't mean I know what the set's gonna look. I don't have any idea what the set's gonna look like until designers start to put things on paper or costumes or makeup, or I don't know what the, the sound is going to be. I, um, I'm working on Sylvia right now and I'm, I'm gonna tell my sound person to find every song you can that refers to having a dog. <laughs> That's one of the shows that I had a composer for. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, it was very fun, fun to work with. <laughs> yeah. I asked that question about the, you know, clashing of ideas for a play. And I never have encountered it as a director because I am like you, Steve. I feel like this is my vision, but then I'm not a designer in any of those fields. So when I come to the, the design table, um, it is collaborative with me. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to design the set like that. I don't know what costumes would work well here in, for the country wife. <laughs> it's like, I know when it's set, so please help me. <laughs> As an actor um, in a show in San Francisco, the, the director 
and the designer clashed and the director was not happy about it. So he kept talking about it and the designer was a bigger name. So the designer won out. So we ended up doing the play uh, three feet off the stage. It was a raked stage um, on plexiglass and nearly slipping and slipping. But the designer was a big name Russian guy. So he did that. And I just remember as an actor at that time, never imagining I'd be a director, but now wondering how, I guess you just deal with it because <laughs> you're paid to do it. And that the other guy's a bigger name, you have to make it happen. But I do, I like the collaborative aspect of um, putting on a show because they all come to the table with their knowledge and their uh, creative imaginations that together we make something bigger and better than I could do on my own, you know? Uh, I'm gonna step back here uh, about uh, to remind people because <clears throat> I think many of our people that I see names and some I know, um, are, in, are based in community theater. And I think it's important to reiterate how important production meetings are, that you actually have to have these. One is not enough, you know? And I know it's hard to get in community theater to get everybody at the table because you've got to schedule it and stuff. But you must at least, you know, before the show before the show is cast, you have to have a strong sense of the kind of movement you're going to need the actors to go through with the set that they're going to plan on building and all those kinds of things. But sometimes I think um, that's a step that some theaters don't count as really that important, oh, we'll chat about it, but you need to chat about it together, not sitting one-on-one. -on -one. Eventually you'll be doing that, but that's later. But um, yeah, you gotta have those production meetings. And um, and if you don't, then, in, in, you know, do it, <laughs> instigate it. Well, because there's there's just problems, potential problems down the road if you don't, because some, one person might be thinking this, the other person thought this, and they didn't talk about it in a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden, oh, we're at an impasse because it's, you know, for whatever reason, um, the door is stage left and it was supposed to be upstage or, or, or whatever, right? Um, but yeah, that is so important, production meetings um, at the community theater, um, wherever, at every theater. But if it's if it's hard to get everyone together on a weekly basis, um, well, we all know how to do Zoom now. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's going that's going to make a big difference. You yeah. know, and and Penny, I agree. Uh, I'm I'm talking more, and and we make a distinction between design meetings and production meetings. But design meetings, it's important if you can to get all the designers in the same place at the same time. Because you, you can work very well with a scenic designer, uh, but if the scenic designer and the lighting designer aren't thinking the same thing, and the costume designer, we run into that sometimes where there's not a, a significant enough discussion about the, the color palette. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so you gotta, or you have costumes that disappear into the set because there wasn't enough communication there. And that, that always has to be my job as the director to make sure there is enough communication there to make sure that everybody gets what they need to, to be able to do their very best. And those come through very, very early design meetings. And I would, at the very bottom of the um, list there of people to talk to, if you're doing Hamlet, if you're doing Romeo and Juliet or a, or a, or a play with the, where you need a fight choreographer, that's one um, I would, I think, because I'm also a fight choreographer, I always like it if the, if the director, if we can meet early, and I know what they want or from, you know, from the other side of it, but as a director, um, being able to touch base with that person. And, and you may not always have someone right away. Maybe the theater is still looking for that fight choreographer um, because obviously the very first thing we need to be concerned with is safety. We wanna make sure that person's qualified to do it. But, um, and now the we're, more and more theaters are using intimacy directors too, which here at CMU we have, um, started to do that because we have someone we have a professor here that 
has studied with um, the, some studied it for two or three years now, I want to say. So she's really brought back, brought back a lot of information about that and experience with that. And it's been wonderful. So I'm hoping more theaters are able to do that and more people are able to get trained in it um, so that we, we all treat the rehearsal hall and our actors with the respect they deserve, obviously, in those tougher scenes that have those intimacy requirements. Um, Steve, have, can I ask a question? I'm sorry, to, I, I okay. hope I didn't interrupt. Oh. Have you used intimacy directors? Uh, I have. I, I directed um, the vibrator play uh, in the next room or the vibrator play uh, a couple years ago. And um, it's it, the, the, the intimate nature of the show. It's, it's a doctor. It's, a, it's about the time that electricity was becoming uh, in coming into everybody's house. And a medical treatment was to use a vibrator um to give women orgasms uh, as a treatment well we're doing i'm doing that on stage with university students and it was, it's the first time that i worked with an intimacy director and um i didn't know what the hell i was supposed to do uh, I, I mean i because i just had not been through the process before and it was it turned out to be a great experience uh, it i had to build in a lot of time because we weren't sure exactly how much time this was going to take, um, but it it's it's really an interesting experience, and it's it's almost going to be mandatory now. Not, not mandatory in the sense that somebody's going to mandate it, but I, I feel as a director that there are many shows I I almost wouldn't want to approach anymore without that kind of guidance. Uh, Keely, I just want to add one other thing to what you were talking about in terms of fight choreographer. I would like to get the fight choreographer to the first design meeting so that they're, they're instrumental in talking about, well, let's think about what kind of shoes these people are going to need to be in to be able to do this. What, what kinds of costumes? How much space do we need? Um, so we're talking again, practical things in the design process about, we don't, we don't have enough room to do this, the, this fight choreography. We, we don't even have fight choreography yet, but we should be thinking about how much space we're going to need and all of those design elements. How much light are we going to have? It, it can't be too dark or people can't fight. Um, and so I, I would like to get those people into the earliest design meetings as I can, because I think they'll be able to inform um, some of the decisions. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, and because safety being the number one concern, making sure they're in the right shoes, they can see what they're doing. Um, what are they wearing? Can they move? Can they swing steel with corsets on? Yes, we can. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so let me move to the next one because I know it's we are um, moving along here. Um, oh, I learned something already. I hope everybody else did. This int intimacy director thing is quite wonderful that it's being incorporated into the theater and plays and things. I don't think that's their original goal when they study this, but I think that they're transferring the day-to-day -day things into the, the play. It, am I right? No? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it also helps helps everybody in the company be more comfortable um it builds trust um um I, I i just think it's it's i i'm not sure that i would need an intimacy uh director for every show that i do right now that i've worked with one i understand some of the techniques and the principles it depends on the nature of the show but if 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 i have a choice i would get one can i ask one more question I'll just be like all the other people in here. How did you find, how do you find these intimacy directors? Well, you can find them on the internet now. I, I mean, it's really in its infancy. People are just being trained. Like Keely said, it's, it's really only been around for three or four or five years in a formal sense. And just like the Society of American Fight Directors developed out of the need for uh, qualified trained people to choreograph uh, violence for the stage, the same is true now. There's really, there's whole um, 
sets of courses, specialized training uh, workshops um, that that people are being trained in. So you can find people online, just like you would find a fight choreographer, or you can find them through the networks of people that you have. But there's just not many out there yet. We're lucky because we have somebody in our faculty who has um, been trained to do that and and is available and interested in doing that often. And she could probably talk about people that she knows that might be available to do that because there'll be a network for that pretty soon. Well, and that also could be another wonderful workshop for CTAM. Yeah, for, yeah. yeah, that because I'm what is pretty, it? Just pretty sure what, most of, what is oh, it? I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'm pretty sure that a lot of us, I'm, I'm not the only one, that a lot of us really, this is a new thing. Yeah. And of course, we love to learn new things. And um, so CTAM people, just check that out. <laughs> That's it. Um, last fall, we I joined a, the faculty member here who is an intimacy director, um, Elaine Darty. if you know her, she's awesome. She and I did a panel in the fall about intimacy um, direction and uh, in costuming, for example, and she, and I I came out more as a director because Elaine and I had worked together on a show called Punk Rock that whereas Steve's show had a lot of there were more sexual intimacy kinds of things potentially with Punk Rock there were more um, uh, it's by si Simon Stevens if anyone knows the play or obviously you know him because he wrote um, Incident of the Dog of the Nighttime but the the play itself when you read it you're like wait a second, there's so many things that the, the actors have to deal with. They call each other awful names. They, they, they do awful things to each other. It's like there are these six students in um, England, in Manchester, and eventually it, it, it escalates to a, a shooting on stage where um, three people are shot and killed on stage. And that's, a, that's tough to deal with, especially in the climate. Now, this was in February of, of um, 20. It was the last show I was able to do before everything shut down. Um, but it's it's a tough show in the climate that we are in currently. Even you know, for so long we've had school shootings and and the and gun violence and things like that. That I remember reading the script and going, oh my goodness, I need to to ask Elaine to work with me. So I just wanted to throw that in, um, and I did that well before I cast, well before, so that when I did cast. Um, on my form, which we're going to get to in a second of um, looking at audition forms, I made sure the students had read the play. They knew the awful words they might have to say, depending on the character they're cast as. If the person who gets cast as William, the character who shoots his friends on stage, you got to read the play and you got to make sure you're ready to do this on stage and go through that. And Elaine was invaluable in that process and creating um, a respectful, safe rehearsal hall where um, not just my actors, but my stage managers, my assistant directors, my dramaturg, everyone felt that we respected the process. Yes, we're dealing with awful and ugly things, but we're doing it in a, in a, in a respectful and professional manner so that when we leave the rehearsal hall, we don't have students falling apart because the emotional stuff they're going through, because as an actor, you know, um, you've got to do that eight times a week when you do it professionally. So. I'm glad you asked that though, Penny, because I think intimacy direction is amazing. And for shows like the Vibrator Play Rock and others, highly recommend. Um, so I'll send you Elaine's email if you want to talk to her. Um, let's, get, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time. Um, I knew I would do this. So <laughs> at, um, the next two, let's look at, the next two we can kind of combine rehearsal schedule tentative looking at considerations you keep in mind when developing your first rehearsal schedule. And this goes along essentially with audition forms and audition scenes. What do you put on the audition forms? What do you, which scenes do you want to choose? And, and I'll start this one with um, punk rock, for example. I did not ask people to do some of the tougher scenes in the play, simply because in the open audition process, I didn't want to ask actors to potentially say things or be in very difficult, sensitive situations when I hadn't even read their audition form and know that they're willing to do it. Um, so in that particular play, I know that I stayed away from that, but I asked them on the form, you know, can you make sure you read this play? Do you think you can do this? Um, what are things that you two would recommend putting on um, 
uh, on the audition form and which scenes might you choose? Well, going back, Keely, to, to an intimacy director, um, when we did the vibrator play, Elaine put out a list for each character and said, this is what the character will be required to do in this play. So even if they've read the play, they can't be confused about it. And like you, you mentioned uh, on the form, they sort of signed off and said, I understand what I'm, I will be asked to do. And yes, I am willing to do it. And they, we asked them to sign that. So it's almost like a waiver to say, I understand I, I've done my homework. Um, so that was part of the form. I did that too. We did that for that. We, we set yeah. each person has to do this. It's and a great idea. So they know what they're getting into. Yeah. But I know Penny, you had talked about. Um, in your um, yeah, I, I sent this along as a something I think all of you people are going to get. Um, it's called, it's just called, a, a, it's my audition information, but what it does for, it, this is more specifically for community theaters because we have such a huge range of all these people coming from everywhere. Um, but what you do is you give them a calendar that says when the rehearsals are, what day, if sometimes even if it's like music rehearsals, you can put that, but you're not putting in specific things, okay? Then they take this calendar and they scratch out all of their conflicts. So when you are casting, you have an opportunity to see that Susie Q is going on a cruise during the third week of, a, this is not a joke, okay? <laughs> this is real. Um, and then you'll have uh, Roger who can't make a couple of the performances, but he really wants to be in the show, okay? So this conflict calendar becomes very serious and theaters that use it, it's very serious. So if you show up to rehearsal the first week and say, oh, you know what? I forgot this conflict and this conflict and this conflict, then it's a real possibility that you might be recast. Um, because in community theater right now, it's one of the hardest job that the director has to do before rehearsal is figure out a rehearsal schedule that works for everybody. It can literally take hours um, based on the size of the cast, of course, and everything. Um, but it's very important that you get those conflicts. Now, of course, people get sick or, you know, stuff like that. That's totally different. Um, so when you have all of those conflicts, on, you make up another calendar for you as the director that puts all the names of all the people in the days where they can't be there. And then you start sorting it out and working it out. But it's become so difficult. Directors all over the country, this is kind of one of the big problems, getting people to be able to make the time commitment and accept it. Um, so this conflict calendar really works. The other thing that's on the conflict calendar and could be on an audition card is what roles are you considering that you would like to play? And the best part is what roles are you un unable to accept? In other words, you don't want to be, you know, the third ingenue or whatever. You want to be a star. And it's perfectly fine to say that. And I have personally done that before because I go in and I know what part I want and I don't want to spend the time not doing another part. So anyway, I, I'll shut up. Oh no, that's really good. <laughs> but I mean, I looked at the clock. Um, oh gosh, I forgot about it's really, it. It's really, it is a huge job that directors did not have to use to spend so much time on. So get all your ducks in a row. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge puzzle to put together. Oh, and then yeah. when very rarely there's there's that person who says they'll accept any role and you cast them as something and then they decline it because it wasn't the role they really wanted. And that there goes your big puzzle piece <laughs> to 
Christians. But then yeah. when people get sad because they're not cast, flip that over. When you cast someone because you really worked hard at your casting and they say, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, that is a hurty hurt. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like being rejected for a part. So, um, so it's, it, it's good to put people in a neutral situation where they, they've already told you I would do this. And most of the time they just put any, you know, but they're, it's, it's respectful. And it makes you not cry. Right. <laughs> this role because you're right. Like if you audition for something and it's like I really want to, it's going to be an investment of my time. I really only want to play this or this role. And so, it's okay. <laughs> We're not going to be mad. <laughs> so anyway, I think that explains. And I think you're going to be set uh, an example after this workshop. Okay. I think. I hope. Um, we have four minutes. I don't know if there was anything else, Steve. I, want to... I, I just have... I, I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> it just, it's it's a question and a comment. It, um, I struggle sometimes with what I'm going to ask actors to prepare for auditions. <clears throat> um, if 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 I'm doing a piece of Shakespeare and I know that that my talent pool doesn't have any experience with Shakespeare. I can't ask for prepared audition pieces. So I try to give them readings of pieces that they can that they can do that I think are manageable. But it's tough because without any experience, it's really hard to get a sense of whether they can handle the language or not. Um, you know, most of the time I'm gonna ask for a, a short prepared piece, a one minute comic or serious monologue, but sometimes um, I, especially for people that aren't ready to do that or, or don't know how to do that, I have to make decisions about whether I'm going to ask them to prepare or not. And then if not, what am I going to have them do in the audition itself? Um, I'm not sure uh, how many community theaters, and, and when we get to you guys, you could tell us, uh, actually ask for prepared monologues. Mm -hmm. Mostly you will get a note before you come to callbacks of what scenes we're going to use and you have the opportunity to come early or, you know, so that you can be prepared, more prepared. But I, I don't know, I'll be, in, I'll be excited to hear from you all. Um, and as you said, uh, both of you said, I think, you don't go for the part of the character that breaks down and falls into pieces, okay? You don't ask the actor to ever do that on call until you're in rehearsals and they built up that, they build it all up. Um, so I think if I were to say in general, um, somewhere in the middle of the play, somewhere where maybe two people are talking about their relationship, they, where they have a human connection. Skip the exposition. Nobody needs that, okay? Um, so I would say make your scenes valuable enough that you can tell how the actor responds to another actor. Yes, they can just listen to each other and be in there. So yeah, I, I don't for the big dramatic stuff. I know if that's the journey for us to take. I know I have to I have to look for that or maybe I've seen the actor before or, or potentially know that they can do that. But can they listen? Can they be in the moment with someone? And then if I if I have an opportunity to offer something like um, some little direction just to see how they might respond to that. Um, it, but it's not I don't want them to feel like it's a test. I'm going to fail the test. Yeah. It's, it's about it, hopefully, because I'm also an actor, so I know it sucks. Um, hopefully it's, it's an enjoyable experience of, um, of working on something and trying something, uh, within a particular scene and an actor you may or may not know. Um, so yeah, and, and hopefully making it a, um, uh, an atmosphere of, of, I guess, inclusivity or where you feel like, yeah, you can be here. You're welcome here. It's not a test. It's not an exam. It is, um, for you to, to show us what you can do.
and it's eight o'clock. Yeah. They are. We did. It's eight o'clock, right on the nose. And we made it all the way through. Yay! <laughs> I'm so proud of us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much to our three panelists. I know I learned a lot. Um, if you have questions, if you want to put them in the chat for them to uh, answer, uh, we're going to do a little Q&A now. Uh, but just a reminder, there are more conference or more uh, seminars this week. We have the technical theater one tomorrow with multimedia in technical theater. And then the one on Friday is for kids and it's technical theater for kids. So if you know any kids that are interested in the technical theater side of, you know, of theater, uh, get them in that. I'm really excited about that one. So if you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we will have a little Q&A. Do you see any, Claudia? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, because you said, uh, though, while we're waiting for questions, you said that you weren't sure what community theaters do for, if there are any that do monologues. Oh, I'd love theater. to know if any, any other community theaters or, or any theater has used the intimacy director. That would yeah, be fascinating. Okay. I'm just I know totally I'm fascinated by it. Just, oh. <laughs> All right, so we have, how do you work with people who audition well, but that's all they have? <laughs> I, I love this question. Oh. Um, I, I did a couple of seasons at um, the Kentucky Shakespeare Festival in Louisville, Kentucky, and we did Richard II, and they hired a guy from New York to play Richard II, and he was terrible, and everybody knew it. And we, we couldn't figure, we kept asking, we were asking producers going, what's going on? And they said, this guy is incredible at auditioning, but he's not good at sustaining a role. And if you looked at his resume, he never got hired at the same place twice. So I don't know how to answer that question. You do the best that you can, unless, you know, if it's a professional theater, they'll fire you and get somebody who can do the role. <laughs> Um, but I, I don't know how to answer, you know, what, that's all they have. I, I guess that's what callbacks are for, to hopefully figure out what else they have, to, to see what kind of range they have, to see what they can bring to the table. Um, that's the best I can do. also have do you ask the actor if they got their vaccine on the audition form this is new 2021 world we live in now i want to answer that one <laughs> um it really is not the director's job to do that it someone has to say it's okay like your board your your theater board i would think the college would have to somewhere else would say we're going to do this. I don't know, Steve. I don't know if I'm right about that, but I don't think that's the director's job. That could be the director's preference, and uh, and that director could make their preference known. But I think uh, the the community theater. If you're in a community theater, you all have to agree that this is the right thing to do. Um, I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> I, well, would hope that I would hope that your theater what would be talking about safety. We're talking about fighting and safety. We're, now we're talking about safety and health. So um, but I think that's a bigger discussion than just the director could do that. I and would, hopefully we won't have to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, we have what are you as a director looking for in an audition i i can a little bit to that depends on the play um if i'm doing shakespeare uh just what steve said depending on the talent pool if if i know they've had exposure to shakespeare i might expect them to come in with um prepared monologues you know 
contrasting classical pieces. Um, if they don't, I think Steve handled that well, like asking them to hear some scenes to read. Um, in general, I'm, I'm looking for someone who's happy to be there, bringing good energy because I am a big believer in, in an ensemble. And, and I mean that because in an ensemble, everyone brings good energy to the rehearsal hall, including the director, including my stage manager, including um, everyone so that we're working together because one, you know, it only takes one person who's unhappy or grumbly, you know, kind of really take the whole energy of the whole process down. Um, so in a rehearsal, or sorry, in an audition, I look for good energy. I look for them to be prepared. If there's something I ask them to prepare, they're, they're ready. Um, and if there wasn't something to be asked to prepare, once they start reading, if they if they suit the role, I look for uh, if they can respond to the other actor. If I, if they're doing scenes, you know, if they're doing um, a, a prepared scene, it might be higher expectations. If it's a cold read, different expectations. But happy to be there, good energy, listening, uh, and, and responding to what's being given to them, and 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 giving something in return. That's excellent, Keely. That was that was perfect. <laughs> I, well, I would only add to that that I want to cast nice people. I and the way I mean that, and when I hear somebody whispering or giggling about somebody's scene that they just read, or you know, you know what I mean, catty and and even if they're trying to be quiet, you can tell. And you like you said, happy. They should be happy to be there and they should be able to talk to people. They should be kind to their partner, whoever they're reading with. Um, they need to be nice. That's it. I, 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 I agree with all of that, but ultimately for me, it's um, can they act? And, and I know almost everything you've talked about is, is part, of, part of acting, but in the end, I wanna know if they can act. And are they right for particular parts? You know, sometimes you have great actors, you just don't have a place for them. Yeah. And, and so I, I'm just trying to figure out whether they can act. I would say I uh, mainly work with preteens and teenagers and I always give them the, um, the note at the beginning of auditions. If I see their cell phone out, that shows me that they wouldn't be able to get through a rehearsal without looking at their cell phone. <laughs> They oh tuck those away. <laughs> um, we have a couple of people responding to the, the COVID protocols and saying that their theaters uh, have it written into their audition packets. Um, and then also just to make sure that it is clear before auditions. Um, so just in response to that COVID vaccination question we had. Um, how do you recommend in uh, how do you recommend inquiring about directing opportunities or jobs at a new to you theater that you don't already have a relationship with? Gosh, <laughs> that came out of nowhere. <laughs> I'm retired, guys. I'm just going to sit back here and let you answer this because I am happy as a player. Okay. <laughs> But Penny, you probably have, as, as the director of, of, of which theater in Grand Rapids, um, you probably, how do you, how do you find directors? Well, the theater I worked at, I was the associate director, there was the artistic director. And so we handled, we directed most of the shows, like, like you at the colleges. Right. Um, so we didn't hire a, uh, maybe one or two at the most, but we have this huge community of directors and everybody that they're just there and they're not just there, they're trained. So that's what I would say, you look for the people that are trained, if, if it's possible, or someone with lots of experience that is good, <laughs> that you maybe have seen the book, you know, yeah. But uh, I have had the best time, and that's why I said I, I'm sitting back and now I'm talking, because when I retired, I, because of ACT, I knew all these people around the country, and I have gotten to go direct at different theaters and stuff in the last five years, and it has been joyful. 
just to go and direct and not have to, you know, run the theater. <laughs> so, uh, but I knew them. I think it's important that you, I don't know. <laughs> get involved probably, if there's any way to get involved with the theaters around there, even if it's not as a director, get involved somehow, volunteer to, to do something backstage to get to know those people before you just step in and try to direct with the new theater. Some people use uh, people that want to be directors as assistant directors mm -hmm. so that they can see the kind of level that they're at and what kind of work that they do. That's a very helpful way to say, maybe first you should be an assistant director. Yeah. So. How do you handle having to replace an actor because they just can't do the part? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't, I don't ever, I, if, if that happens, it's my fault um, because I've done a poor job casting. If I cast somebody in a role that they can't do, it's my fault. And it's unlikely that I'm going to toss them from the show. I'm going to do everything in my power to help them give a good performance or the best performance that they can give within the limits of what they have. Um, but I, you know, I, I had somebody who was late to a rehearsal and took it kind of casually. And then the next night came late to a rehearsal and I said, thank you very much. Please go away. I, I said, I'm sorry, I don't need you in the show. And I got somebody else to do it. I, I don't have any tolerance for that. It's too much work and takes up too much time. And, um, and, and if I can respond sort of in the same breath to this other question, would I cast a person who has great stage presence but paraphrases their lines in every show? No, I would not. And, and I would remind everybody that it's technically against the law to change a single word in a script. You, you sign a contract with whoever, either the, the agent who's handling the play or a dramatist or whoever you deal with, MTI, um, and you've made an agreement to do the play exactly as it is written. You don't have the luxury or the, the right to change it and, and actors don't either. Now actors are a little bit different because they may be trying to do the play as written, but I wouldn't cast that person again. Um, I, I just wouldn't. Learn the damn lines. <laughs> All right, we have, what do you do differently when holding auditions for children? Uh, I do have done and do a lot of children's theater. I don't do anything different. The same process. If it's a musical, they bring their 16 bars, they dance with the choreographer. It's, I don't do anything different. There really isn't any reason to do anything terribly different unless they're like four. And then what I would be doing is running out the door. <laughs> but children that are eight or over, they, they understand. You tell them what you need and how to do it. And um, Civic Theater had uh, created a little booklet that you could download that explained the audition process. So if you've never done this before, and it was for both children and adults, but it's the, you, it's the same. It's the same respect you have for them. Um, I don't know, I don't, the only time I didn't, um, the weirdest one was Helen Keller because I had to cast all these little girls and, and especially um, the miracle workers, what I meant. Um, and uh, I just had them do improv. It was all improv, but that was because of the show, not because they were children. So that's my answer. We, uh, at Central, we don't, we don't have any guidelines about how to audition children. Penny, the way you're talking about, you know, I think we would do the same. 
but we have a lot of paperwork and a lot of rules and regulations about who can be in the room, who must be in the room to protect children. We, you know, um, we have to have people that are approved by the university to watch. They have to be within sight of somebody all the time. Oh. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's to avoid legal problems. Um, the university is really strict about that. They don't tell us anything about the artistic side of it, um, but in terms of the logistics, uh, we have a lot of hoops to jump through to ensure, and it, and it really protects not only the children, but it protects us as well. And I've done what you mentioned, um, like doing Sound of Music, handling it very much just like with everyone else. But then there have been shows like Shrek where there's just a couple kids and like Dracula, the musical has, a, depending, one or two kids. And those were, I, I did choose to do this sort of special um, it, with Dracula in particular, because there was a, uh, you know, the, the child has to walk by bloody necks and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, uh, I actually was talking to a couple moms who would approve, like, do you think that this child can handle it, da, da, da. And, and eventually that's one of the ways I cast in that situation because it was really a different kind of circumstance. Um, it's yeah. not, where's my thought? So happy and <laughs> becomes happy. Um, but the, so just as a different kind of perspective on, um, I have done it a little differently for that reason. I haven't worked with many children to tell you the truth. My, my one story was um, I, I was in a production and it, it turned out there was a kid, like an eight-year-old who was in every scene that I was in. And somehow I had to be the kid wrangler for that kid because we were in the same scenes. And the kid was great, you know, the kid was great. And, you know, he was standing right in front of me in this one scene and it was the first performance and he started fooling around. He started dancing and making faces and I had him by the shoulders and I just dug my thumbs into his shoulders and leaned down and said, don't do that anymore. <laughs> and he didn't. We never had a problem after that. Well, no, you scared him to death. Yeah. <laughs> uh, working with kids is my, my specialty usually. And so I will say, I did learn from my first audition with children not to let them pick whatever they wanted to do for their song. Cause I heard a lot of um, this is me from the greatest showman, which is just not in any child's range really. Uh, so when I audition kids, I tend to give them very specified, like you're going to do this song, this song, or this song, and this like piece or this piece or this piece. So that way they're actually showing me what I need to see. Uh, because they don't have that, like with adults, we can look at a script and go, oh, this is what I should show off kids. Unless they have a really intense stage parent, have a hard time with that. Um, when you have mixed casts age-wise, do you audition the adults uh, with the kids or do you audition them separately? Okay. Um, think musicals, okay. Um, at GR Civic, they are split. Children have a whole audition time where they do their musical. The, the whole process is exactly the same as for the adults, but they don't intermingle until callbacks. And then you, you know, you find the person who looks right with these mom and dad and, you know, all that stuff. But initially they uh, are separated. Part of it is because of what you said, Claudia, you're never sure what they're going to hear <laughs> and take home to mom and dad. <laughs> All right. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to our three panelists for uh, being here tonight and talking to us about getting ready for auditions as a director. Um, it was really great to see uh, you guys. Uh, Keely and Steve were professors of mine in, at college. So this is a little surreal sitting in their directing class all over again. So uh, I hope everybody has a great night. Remember there are two more uh, seminars tomorrow and Friday and we hope to see you there. Thank you for coming guys. Thanks everybody. If you, if Thank you have you. questions, this was great fun. we'll get back to you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>